Hello, friends. I've been thinking a lot about how the Apostle John ended his testimony of Jesus Christ, at least the testimony that we have. I'm speaking of um, uh, John in the uh, New Testament. He said that if all of the works of Jesus Christ were recorded, the very earth could not contain them. That's a very interesting thing for John to say. Because he's writing this, most you know, Bible scholars think sometime between 70 and 100 uh, AD. So um, this is after John has been translated. And if you, you know, were not aware that John was translated, he talks about it you know, just in the, the verses. I mean, it's really the context for it, this statement. If you look at the verses you know, preceding this, and this is in John chapter 21, um, he's talking about when he was with Christ and you know, Peter and James, uh, and Christ asked him, hey, what do you want? I'll give you anything you want. But first he said, feed my sheep. Three times, if you love me, feed my sheep. And then both Peter and James say, hey, we want to come to you as soon as possible and rule with you in your kingdom. But that's not what John said. John said, I want to feed your sheep until you come again. And that's the context. So John was translated. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants uh, section 7 talks about this also. So John is different from all of the other original 12 apostles because he was translated. And, you know, we don't know a whole lot about that process. We learn more about that process in the Book of Mormon when the three Nephites who were translated also uh, were caught up into heaven and they saw uh, things that they could not talk about. But I think that's very key. Um, they had a perspective that was very unique. And I think that when John is saying, hey, the things that you know about Christ, it's nothing. If everything could be written about what Christ, who he actually is, and the things that he, have, he has done, this earth could not contain those records. So let me put this into context, because I don't believe like many people probably do, that John was just exaggerating and that what did he know? I mean, where had his life uh, travels, you know, taken him that, you know, he would, you know, know about the earth's, you know, 200 million uh, square miles of, of surface area to be able to, and I'm just talking land, that he could make such a bold statement that uh, it could not contain uh, all of the, the works and deeds of Jesus Christ. Well, I think that if we really want to understand this, we need to understand it from the perspective of another translated being. And this being is Enoch. He and his entire city were lifted up, right? We learn about this in Moses chapter 7. And the part of Moses chapter 7 that really stands out to me is found in verse 30 and 31. And you know, this is the verse where, these are the passages where you know, Enoch is talking to the Lord after the Lord is weeping at the wickedness that's transpiring upon this earth. And he says, you know, Lord, if you were to take this earth and break it down into its particles, and if you could somehow number all of those particles and millions of earths like this, it wouldn't be the beginning of the, the creations or the workmanship of thy hands. So let's think about that for a little while, because this is coming from Enoch is talking about this after he has been translated, just like John. So I know this that this is an impossible task to try to put some scope on this, but that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, <clears throat> so when Enoch was saying, if you could break the earth into its particles, you know, we know that, you know, we can break, you know, what is a particle? Um, is it an atom? Is it a quark? You know, who, I doubt that that's what he was talking about. In the, in the scriptures, when people are, you, you know, using small, you know, increments, the particle of the scriptures is a grain of sand, right? I mean, if you could, innumerable as the grains of sand, um, it's the sands upon the seashore. So let's assume that Enoch was talking about particles as if, you know, if the whole world could be you know, balance and weighed, you know, in with a unit of measure of grains of sand. Uh, um, 
and then you multiply that by millions of other Earths like it, because Enoch is talking about all of this from the perspective of inhabited worlds. Um, and you know, the whole Pearl of Great Price is so fascinating because, I mean, just look at the chapter heading, heading of Moses chapter one. Just read that chapter heading. It says, Moses sees many inhabited worlds um, and that the Lord has created worlds without number. So Enoch knew this. He had seen it. And so he's, he's tried to quantify it the best to the best of his abilities. And to do that, he uses two, two units of measure, grains of sand and earth-like planets. So let's see if we can work some of this math. Now, these numbers get so incredibly large that, you know, we, we could not, I mean, you couldn't even plug these numbers into a calculator, okay? So we've got to use scientific notation. Um, if you were to estimate the size of a grain of sand, and obviously, I mean, grains of sand aren't all the same, but um, let's assume that there are 5 billion grains of sand uh, in a ton, and I'm not just pulling that uh, out of the air. Um, uh, that is an uh, estimate that um, comes from some research, but uh, even if it's higher or lower by an order of magnitude, you will soon see that it doesn't really matter. Okay, so let's assume that there are, in fact, 5 billion grains of sand per ton. Well, the Earth, the mass or weight of the Earth is about 6 to 6 multiplied by 10 to the power of 21 um, tons. So you'd have to multiply 5 billion times that number. So uh, to do that, 5 billion in scientific notation is 5 times uh, 10 to the power of 9 multiplied by 6 times 10 to the power of 21. So what is that? That's you know, 6 times 5 is 30. Um, when you're multiplying exponents, you just add them. So you have 30 <clears throat> times 10 to the power of 30. Uh, so that's really 3 times 10 to the power of 31. <clears throat> That's how many grains of sand, that's our estimate for if you were to convert the weight of the earth into uh, grains of sand. Now, um, so then you take that number and um, Enoch said millions, multiply that by millions of other earths like it. So millions is plural. So it's not just one million um, and it's probably not just two. So just for our argument's sake, um, let's say three million other Earths. And whether you're saying one, two, or three, it really doesn't matter um, because these numbers get so big so quickly. But if you say, if you multiply our three to the power or times 10 to the power of 30 by three times 10 to the power of six, which is three million, then you get nine times uh, 10 to the power of 37. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, but then, you know, Enoch says, that's not the beginning of the number of egg creations. So if 9 times 10 uh, to the power of 37 is not the beginning, well, when you're counting, the beginning is always 1. Right, so Enoch is saying this isn't. Uh, let's just talk percentages. So one percent. Enoch is saying this isn't. This isn't one. It's not the beginning. So let's just say okay, it's it's half of one. Okay, it's half of a percent. Um, then you're talking nine times ten uh, to the power of thirty-seven divided by five times ten to the negative three. <clears throat> uh, so you divide. 9 by 5, it's going to get you just under uh, 2, 1.8. Um, and then when you're dividing by exponents, you actually uh, uh, add it. So um, that is 10 to the power of 40. So 1.8 times 10 to the power of 40. Okay, so this is what you know, Enoch is saying. Hey, 
you have created innumerable worlds and an estimate using you know these estimates that I've talked about puts that you know somewhere in the range of what you know let's say two times ten to the power of forty now what's you know a couple orders of magnitude when you're talking about numbers this incredibly large so and I said before that uh, when Enoch was talking about this, he was talking about, you know, particles and inhabited worlds. And the reason that uh, I say that is because in verse 31 of Moses chapter 7, um, he says, And you have taken Zion, meaning my city and all my people, up into your own bosom. And you have brought righteous people from all thy creations, from all eternity to all eternity, to Zion. So that's why I say Enoch's not just talking about, hey, asteroids and uninhabited planets. He's talking about Earth-like planets. In fact, he even says uh, Earth-like planets. So that is amazing that um, Enoch would use numbers like that. But he had seen things that other people hadn't seen. Moses saw uh, something but uh, similar to this, but the Lord told Moses, hey, listen, you haven't seen half of it. I'm just showing you a little part um, of this. And even you know, Moses was overwhelmed by it. But um, Moses said, hey, I saw many, many lands, and all of them had people on it, and each one of them was called Earth. And so what are we talking about? We're talking about a universe that is so vast that it could not possibly just be limited to what we can see with the Hubble telescope. Um, and let me explain why. So with the Hubble telescope looking out into the universe, we can, scientists estimate that there are about two trillion galaxies. The Milky Way is a galaxy. Okay, so two trillion, that's two times 10 to the power of 12, right? <clears throat> um, Enoch's inhabited worlds, remember, was, you know, approximately two times 10 to the power of 40. So the number of galaxies is nothing. Now, we know that, you know, inhabited worlds don't just float through space all by themselves. They revolve around suns and they're, they're in solar systems. So if you look at the number of stars just in the Milky Way galaxy, you know, scientists estimate that there's about 300 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So, uh, and the Milky Way galaxy, you know, isn't even a huge galaxy. Um, it's probably, it's, you know, a medium sized galaxy. Uh, and it's, geez, by itself, I think it's a hundred uh, million light years across. So it, it's vast, but it's, it's small. So, but if we assumed that all galaxies had 300 billion stars in them, um, well, then you're talking about <clears throat> 300 billion times 2 trillion. So that's uh, 2 times 10 to the 12 times 3 times 10 to the 11. So that's 6 times uh, 10 to the 23, right? Um, so you've got 6 times 10 to the 23 compared to what Enoch put forward as, you know, approximately 2 times 10 to the 40. <clears throat> So if you were to divide all of those um, potential solar systems that scientists ex you know, believe exist in our galaxy or in our sol universe, I should say, you're talking about six times 10 to the 23 potential solar systems. But so if you divide that number into the mathematics of Enoch's inhabited worlds of two times 10 to the 40, you're talking about, you know, there would have, there would, there are, there would have to be multiverses, right? The, it could not all exist into a single universe. No, um, there'd have to be more. And uh, if you look at what scientists are now saying, you know, there are, you know, probably a plurality of scientists that are now saying it, it has to be a multiverse, guys. Um, 
And, you know, Enoch is saying this same thing at the dawn of our, you know, recorded uh, history. So, I mean, it's just, it's just mind blowing. Uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, um, when the Lord is trying to explain all of this, you know, he, well, first in Doctrine and Covenants section 76, um, it says, I believe this is in uh, verse 24, it says that Jesus Christ created all, everything, and by him and through him, the worlds are and were created. And that through him, through his atonement, which was carried out upon this earth, all of the sons and daughters of all of those worlds become begotten sons and daughters of God. So Jesus Christ is the savior of the worlds. And that is something that is beyond our ability to comprehend. It would require there to be trillions of multiverses, of universes just like ours, in order to account for the numbers that uh, Enoch put forward as inhabited Earths. So now you have what John is talking about makes more sense, right? Because John, at this point, has seen the same things that Enoch has seen. He's a translated being. Now, a lot of people don't really understand um, this whole mysterious concept of becoming translated. It's not common. Um, I mean, we we know of two large bodies of people that were translated, um, the people from the city of Enoch and Melchizedek's people. And if you read in uh, uh, the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 14, you learn that Melchizedek and all of his people um, desired and sought for the city of Enoch and obtained it. Um, and it says that uh, they were translated. So they were translated, taken off of this earth because, I mean, you know, when you're translated, it, you have a, a different um, sphere of existence. Um, and we know the three Nephites were translated and we know that John was translated. Uh, it's possible that there have been uh, others as well, but, you know, it's clearly the exception uh, rather than the rule at least here. Now, Joseph Smith knew more about this than he, uh, than most of us understand. Um, in Alma chapter 12, I think it's in verse 9, you know, Alma starts talking about the mysteries of God, and he says, listen, it's given to many to know the mysteries of God, but when you obtain the mysteries of God, you are put under strict commandment that you do not impart with the children of men that which, you know, they don't, haven't already received. But there are several pearls from Joseph Smith where, I mean, he says things where you clearly know that he understood much, much more than we do today. Um, and one of those things is where he's talking about translated beings. And I'm just going to talk about this, but I'll throw the reference um, uh, when I, uh, publish this video so that you can look it up yourself. But um, he says, you know, people aren't just translated, you know, for no reason. Um, pe when people are translated, they're translated so that they can minister to other worlds. And that's exactly what Enoch said, um, where we're at now. So, of, of course, you know, our doctrine uh, meaning the doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it's so it's vastly different from that of uh, the other um, Christian uh, sects of our day. Um, but it is not new. I mean, this knowledge was had in antiquity. Uh, and in fact, you know, the early fathers in Christ's original church in the day of the uh, original 12 apostles, they knew these things as well. Um, I mean, you have Philo of Alexandria, who was a, you know, a famed scriptorian, you know, in, I mean, he, he lived during the days of Christ. He, you know, he said, listen, it must needs be that the universe is filled with living things. So they got it. We need to get it. Uh, and we need to understand that, you know, 
God, being the God of the universe, you know, has lots of moving parts. And we're one component um, of a very vast, incredible work that is so far beyond our ability to comprehend as to boggle our minds. And you know, towards the end of uh, Moses chapter 7, the same chapter where Enoch gives us the mathematics of the universe, he, the Lord tells Enoch, says, listen, the day is going to come when this earth that we're looking at right now, which, by the way, has the most wicked people and the most wicked behavior of any of the creations which I have made. So, again, we're talking something like 2 times 10 to the power of 40 worlds. And amongst all of those, we are the worst. We are the most wicked. Now, there's reasons for that, right? Um, just read, uh, I think it's Revelations chapter 12, and it'll start to make a little more sense. But um, he says, it's not always going to be this way. He says that the day is going to come when your city will return to this planet. And... When that day comes, Zion will be established again uh, on this planet. And then he says, and it will come forth from all the creations which I have made. Meaning, just like Enoch said, his city is being visited by all the creations that the Father or the Son has made uh, as part of the Father's great plan of salvation says the earth is going to become that. Um, that's what the New Jerusalem is. It will be a galactic hub of righteousness and education, and um, it will be where people come to learn about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that is much more. The house of Israel is much more than this earth. Um, Abraham, who received these covenants and this, these promises, um, he was shown the whole plan before it started, all you know the intelligences that existed before the world was. And he was told, listen, Abraham, you're one of those. And many of those noble and great ones are here on this earth. And in fact, I wanted to test them, the noble and great ones. And so we created this earth specifically for that purpose. And I said that this earth is, is unique, and we know that Satan's here. Um, he was cast down to this earth. And in Revelations 12, it says, I think it's 12, um, uh, it says that the all the heavens rejoiced when Satan was cast down to this earth. And then it said, but O ye inhabitants of this earth, their woe has come unto you, because Satan hath been cast down amongst you, and he knows that he hath but a short time. And Satan is waging war, first and foremost, on the house of Israel. And that war has been incredibly successful. Um, in fact, in that same um, chapter in uh, Revelations, you know, it's, it starts with this wonder in heaven, with this woman standing um, with uh, the moon um, at her feet, and she's clothed with the sun, and she's got a crown of, of 12 stars uh, on. This is, and she's pregnant. Um, she's bringing forth a, a man-child that will rule the nations. Okay? We're talking about the house of Israel here. Um, I know that the chapter heading talks about it as being the church, but, you know, the church is a um, is hope, hopefully representative of the house of Israel, right? But it's first and foremost the house of Israel, not first and foremost the church, because the church uh, came about through uh, the house of Israel and the ministration of the uh, of Jesus Christ and His gospel. Um, but it talks about how the dragon makes war with this woman and seeks to destroy her child, but cannot. Um, the child is brought up to the throne of God. And then this the main body of this woman, meaning the main body of the house of Israel, is given wings of a great eagle and leaves um, the face of the dragon. The dragon cannot get her. 
Um, and the dragon is bound to this earth. Satan and his hosts are bound here. So that means that a large body of the house of Israel was removed and you know, taken elsewhere. And it says that, you know, because she was removed, that, you know, Satan was wroth and he went and sought to destroy the remnant of her seed who had the testimony um, of Jesus Christ. And so the main body of the house of Israel, meaning the last 10 tribes, was removed. That doesn't mean that there aren't onesie twosie uh, members of the house of Israel through every um, scattered uh, country on the continent that, or on the world. Um, this earth anyways, that's clearly the case. But uh, you read Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, verse 4, and Moses is telling you know, the house of Israel, listen, you're going to be scattered. And that's because you break your covenants. But the day will come that though there be those among you who are driven to the outermost parts of heaven, from thence the Lord will gather you in the last days. That's that's pretty amazing. Now, I mean, there there are so many scriptures that talk about this, and um, you know, I've you know, as you're you're probably well aware, I've written you know four books that talk about you know these these things, and the only reason I'm bringing this up is because this is so much more than most of us have ever thought about before. And we need to break that, uh, you know, our self-imposed blinders, okay? There is a really important section in the Doctrine and Covenants, it's section 10. And in this section, it's talking about the last 116 pages. But that's not what makes this section interesting. What makes this section interesting is because the Lord is talking to Joseph Smith about why it doesn't really matter that the 116 pages were lost. And if you look for this, you will find it. Um, if you don't look for it, you won't. This is like this is like so many things in the scriptures. The scriptures are like an onion. There are many, many layers. And most people just pick up the outside layer of that onion and they look at it and that's it. They never go in any deeper than the skin of the onion. Um, but just as a, you know, you're riding a speedboat along the surface of the uh, of a lake from one side to the other. I mean, that's how most people look at the scriptures. I mean, how many times have you read the Book of Mormon, right? Probably many times. But you probably are reading it on a schedule, trying to get it done by a certain day. Uh, and that's like, you know, riding, you know, in the speedboat, you know, as fast as you can go across the surface of the lake. And you know nothing about the profound depths below you. Um in this section, section Doctrine and Covenants uh, 10, Christ gives some commentary on the Book of Mormon. And that commentary is amazing. He says, basically, just paraphrasing this, says the Book of Mormon is comprised of two parts. The first part is known as the Plates of Nephi, or the Record of Nephi, which is, you know, far and away... Um, first and second Nephi from a chapter, just looking at the sheer number of uh, chapters, right? Um, and he says, I had this part included because of my wisdom. And it's included to benefit the Gentiles. And the other part of the Book of Mormon is everything else besides this part. And it's included in there because my holy prophets, meaning the holy Book of Mormon prophets, they prayed that those things might be included and be brought forth um, to their brethren in the last days and also to the Gentiles. And that's what the balance of the Book of Mormon is. So think about that. If there's two parts of the Book of Mormon and one of the parts is in there because Christ wanted it to be in there and the other part is in there because his servants wanted it to be in there, which part should you focus on? Now, First and second Nephi, um, that's not the part that most people do focus on, right? Particularly second Nephi. Um, but the distinction between first and second Nephi is totally arbitrary, right? There is no first and second Nephi. It's only Nephi. And we're not reading Nephi's journal. Um, Nephi's closing, closing remarks 
So Second Nephi chapter 33, right? You know, in the closing section, chapter 33 of Second Nephi, Nephi says, listen, you and I will stand before the judgment bar of God in the last days. And in that day, you will know that these are not my words. They are Christ's words. And he commanded me to write them. So is it just a coincidence that Nephi transcribes 19 Isaiah chapters and gives commentary on those chapters? Um, and that's that makes up the bulk of those writings. And when Christ came to the Nephites, he told them, he, he said, hey, ye ought to search these things. He, he, he expounds the words of Isaiah to the Nephites, the same chapters that are included in uh, Second Nephi. He expounds those to them. He says, ye ought to search this. I mean, just look at, I think this is Second or Third Nephi, chapter 23, verse 1. You have to search these things, guys. And he says, no, nope, I command you to search these things. This is the, the part of the Book of Mormon that we take for granted. Also in the Doctrine and Covenants, you know, the Lord says, hey, the whole church is under condemnation for taking lightly the Book of Mormon. What part of the Book of Mormon, seeing says it's composed of two portions, the portion Christ wanted in there and the portion his prophets wanted in there, which part are we taking for granted? We read this part, we study this part, we don't do justice to the portion that Christ said he wanted included. Um, and we need to. That portion of the Book of Mormon is very special. It's different. Uh, it reads very differently from the rest of the Book of Mormon until you get into Third Nephi when Christ is talking about the same message. Uh, and that begins in Third Nephi chapter 15, starting in verse 10, goes to uh, verse 4 of Third Nephi chapter 17, where he stops and says, guys, your eyes are glazing over. You're too tired. You can't understand this message. And so you need to go home and pray that the Father will help you understand it. Because you need to understand this. I'm putting this in here, you know, to help you. Um, not just to make this book more challenging for the Gentiles to read in the last days. Um, and then he says, while you're gone, I'm going to go minister to the lost tribes of Israel. And he does. And then he comes back, and I think it's uh, uh, chapter 20, chapter 20, verse 10 where he says, now I'm going to continue with the message that my father commanded me to give you. And he starts by talking about the, the last verse in uh, Third Nephi chapter 16 that he was expounding to them. This message is important for us to understand. If you want to understand the words of Isaiah, you need to start in these 19 chapters and the context in which they were included. And the context in which they were included was Nephi's vision of the tree of life. He sees this incredible vision. The context of that vision was, Listen, my father told me about something, and I know that if I go and ask the Lord, he will help me to understand these things for myself. I don't need to rely on someone else to spoon feed this information to me. The Lord can teach me. The Lord can be my teacher. In fact, you look at 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 1, what does it say? It says, you know, I, Nephi, being born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat after all the learning of my father. Um he was taught somewhat after the learning of his father. Nephi knew a lot, but he's saying, hey, I, I had a great knowledge of the mysteries of God. That's what he says in the first uh, verse of First Nephi. He was taught a lot by his father, but mostly by the Lord. That's what we need to do. We need to, we can be, other people can put us on the path. They can point us on the covenant path. We need other people to do that for us. Nobody can get onto the covenant path by themselves. It's impossible. Uh, you can't baptize yourself for one. So other people, we need help to get to the covenant path. But then it is our privilege to be taught by the Father. And we should seek that. And that is the context of Nephi's vision of the tree of life. And the context of, the Nephi, of Nephi's vision of the tree of life is the events that will transpire upon the American continent in the last days. And you know, right to where you know, at the point where it's getting good, you know, the, the Lord tells Nephi, don't talk anymore about this. John will talk about it. Isaiah will talk about it. But Nephi won't. Not in the language that Nephi uses anyway. Um, and so in the very next chapter, um, chapter 15, 
Nephi starts talking about Isaiah and then trans transcribes 19 Isaiah chapters. Um, Mormon, when he was compiling the Book of Mormon, um, he was going to include everything that the Lord said. And the Lord said some incredible things to the Nephites. And the Lord appeared to Mormon and says, Mormon, I don't want you to do that. He said, I gave them what I wanted. Um, and they have that part. And if they will receive that part, which is meant to try their faith, then through the administration of the Holy Ghost, they'll receive the rest of it. But if they don't receive that part, they'll receive what they'll receive, and that's it. That should frighten us, because the Lord expects us to take responsibility for our own spiritual education. It's not the prophet's responsibility to tell us everything that we need to do. Um, we should be seeking counsel from the Lord, um, because... The prophet has told us that the day is going to come where you will not survive unless you have the constant guiding influence of the Holy Ghost in your life. Why would he say that if we will always have him to listen to? Okay? We need to be spiritually independent. Um, the Lord is always there. Um, so we need to learn how to hear him in our lives. Learn how to be taught by him. Um, the Lord can teach us in a myriad of ways, but the most effective way, and again, this is the context for how all of this incredible information was introduced into the Book of Mormon to begin with, is Nephi sitting pondering upon a rock. Are you pondering these things? That's where it starts. When you ponder deeply, when you meditate on gospel topics, the Lord teaches you. And we're all taught in different ways through, you know, the spiritual gifts that we've received. But as we learn to hear him, the message that he has to tell us will knock your socks off. And, you know, if you would like some help with this process, you know, I, you know, I encourage you to, you know, read any of my books. Um, if you, you know, if you haven't read any of my books, I, you know, I'd start with the light and plainness, um, which goes through the Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon, and then I'd encourage you to read Daniel eleven, which you know many people have heard about Ezra Ziegel. Uh, Ezra Ziegel was given in context to Daniel eleven. He's even told that uh, by the angel. So then I'd read A Remnant Shall Return which is a pretty intense book. Um, but it shows you how many prophets talked about these things. I never write about something in my books, but that I show you many different examples of prophets who have taught the same thing so that you can start seeing the pattern for yourself and you can start recognizing these things yourself. You don't need me to point them out to you um, once you know what to look for. You'll see them yourself. Uh, and then, you know, probably the crowning book of everything that I've written is Revelation, the vision of John the Divine. Um, John the Revelator is spoken of three times uh, in the Book of Mormon. And that's incredible because nobody in the Book of Mormon knew John the Revelator. But Nephi was told John's going to write about these things. Um, Christ told his apostles about John the Revelator. And then uh, Moroni, when he's talking about the incredible things that the brother of Jared saw, he says, listen, guys, um, when these things start to happen, you're going to understand what John was talking about. So Moroni knew John um, and what John talked about. So that's, I mean, if you haven't read that book, it's not the first book to start with. I, I, please do not start with my book, Revelation, The Vision of John the Divine. You know, but... I would encourage you to read the other ones and then read that one. And it's it's the crowning <clears throat> revelation of the last days. And it'll knock your socks off. Um, it goes, it ties back in to Enoch and Moses and this incredible God of the entire universe and what the millennium really means and looks like. Um, because this is so much more 
than what you have ever thought um, about before. So, you know, I just encourage you, friends, to, you know, be a seeker. Look, don't, you know, we're coming up to a general conference, and general conference is great, but if general conference is the sum and substance of your study of the gospel, you're living beneath your privileges. Um, and, you know, if if that's all you do, well, guess what? You don't really need the Holy Ghost, do you? Because you know, everyone's going to tell you what you need to know. Um, obviously, that is incorrect. So, you know, we are blessed to have uh, prophets and apostles and uh, church leaders. Um, but David O. McKay said in general conference, he said, listen, guys, there's basically, you know, two sources of information. You know, there's information that you can get from people in authority, like the information you're getting here in general conference. And then there's information that you can obtain through the spirit, through meditation, through pondering. He says, of those two sources, the information you're going to get from meditating and through the spirit is much more important to you. That's incredible for the prophet to say that in, you know, the context in which he said it, was, which was general conference. So, friends, you know, crazy things are starting to happen around us. Um, and, you know, we need to start opening our eyes. And the way that we open our eyes is by asking the Lord, what do you want us, what do you want me to know? And start studying that. And then you got to realize that you don't study these things on a schedule. Um, you know, there are many manuals that the church puts out that are great. Um, you know, but think of it this way, and I, I don't want, you know, people to be uh, um, offended by this, but um, I mean, our education starts out in elementary school and we start out very basic and then we move up, you know, through high school. Um, in, if you want to have the advanced spiritual teaching, um, you need to get that from the Lord because the Lord has commanded our, you know, uh, leadership of this generation to say nothing but repentance. Um, we're going to be hearing a lot about the basics of, of the gospel, and that's their charge. It is not their charge to, you know, Elder Bednar said, listen, it's not the church's responsibility to teach you everything that you should know or everything that you should do said, if all you know, this is what Elder Bednar said, if all you know about the gospel of Jesus Christ is what I or other people have told you, then your testimony is built upon sand. In other words, guys, you need to be start, you need to learn how to be educated by the Lord. And there is no way that you can understand what the Lord put in the Book of Mormon without him teaching you about it. So I encourage you, to seek the Lord and what he put in the Book of Mormon for you and your family to understand. Um, and if you will do that, I promise you that you will be prepared for whatever is coming. Whatever is coming, you will be prepared. The most important preparations that you can make are spiritual in nature. Okay, When the scriptures say, even the very elect according to the covenant will be deceived by this Antichrist that's coming. And I'm talking about uh, Joseph Smith translation of uh, Matthew uh, 24. It says, we need to be prepared uh, because something is coming. It's talked about ad nauseum in these sections, which Christ in his wisdom had included in the Book of Mormon and which we in our stupidity ignore to our, you know, great sorrow. So I, I hope that you will make it your goal to, to learn why the Lord commanded Nephi to put these things uh, in the Book of Mormon. And it will, I promise you that by studying these things, it will make the scriptures come alive to you in ways that you never thought possible. And I promise you that. Uh, until next time, friends, um, I hope that uh, you find joy in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that it is enriching your life, that 
you understand what a privilege it is for you to witness the days that we are living in. Um, and I hope that you will be able to have eyes to see what is really happening around us. Um, until next time, God bless.